Okay, so next part of chapter five, we're dealing with complex traits, or as we also call them, polygenic traits or quantitative traits. Basically, where you have a lot of genes all contributing to a particular phenotype. So height is a really good example. Uh, we almost have this little bimodal distribution um, determined by uh, biological sex, again, with asterisks there um, uh, in general. But in general, the um, <laughs> cats are back. Uh, presence of the uh, sex determining region and um, testosterone uh, effects on growth mean that men are on average slightly taller than women. Okay? But it's not a discrete trait. There's not, you know, we don't have height A, B, and C. We have a range of heights that we can actually measure and quantify. Okay. And so uh, there's lots of different alleles going of different genes that are all affecting height as well as the environment, such as um, uh, stunting is when you don't have enough calorie intake when you are a child developing and your bones and body do not grow to your maximum height. So that's something that can happen if you are nutritionally deficient. So you may be um, genetically predisposed to be tall, but then the environmental influence will affect whether or not that actually occurs. Okay. So, so we have um, one of the things you can tell whether or not an, the environment is really having an effect on height is sort of the spread of your of your averages here. So in this case, we've got um, three uh, genotypes. Okay, that in this case it's just um, one gene, but we have genotype one, the heterozygote, the homozygous dominant, and there's a very clear and distinct pattern for what height you are if you have this genotype. And so here's our mean in the center, and then the spread here is also called the variance, okay? We can, how much that, the numbers vary from the central mean, and that is usually expressed in terms of the standard deviation from the mean, okay? And over here, we've got, uh, here's our mean-ish, and then the spread is much wider. The environment is really kind of pushing or pulling um, the expression of that trait in either direction. Okay? So this is more, we're going to talk a lot about means and variance here, but we're going to say the higher the variance, the more there's a environmental effect going on. So now instead of just one gene, so down here we've got, this is actually a heterozygote uh, crossing with a heterozygote. We've got three genes involved, six alleles total. And then we're going to have this range of offspring that have everything from all recessive to all dominant genes. And the more dominant genes, okay, that you have, the, what, what do we have? The higher our weight is, okay? So right in the middle, if you have about half of each, you see this little median, or sorry, the mean here, and then we have our variance is pretty tight because in this top graph, we have a low environmental effect. But then the second graph down at the bottom here, when we have a high environmental effect, you see that variants start to spread out. And overall, the graph starts to look like just a big curve there, okay? So all these different, how many alleles you have that contribute to a higher weight will matter in this case, okay? We're starting to see, instead of having discrete traits, we have this nice curve here. Now we still have a couple that we can zoom zone in on, sort of that um, trait that has all recessive, whatever offspring have the most least amount there. And then we have the, whoever has all the dominant stacking traits for weight there. We sort of have these, what we call the extreme. Watch me draw. <laughs> I should have invested in a tablet. All right, extreme traits we're gonna use to figure out some very important numbers later on. Yeah. Now we have another um, idea here. Is this here's the curve, and we're not showing all the little humps and the alleles and such. But there's an idea that that you can have um, predisposing alleles. Okay, if you have if there's a particular condition. In this case, we're looking at clinical diabetes. The more alleles you have that dispose you to this, the higher your likelihood of chance of getting it. But you're not going to have a problem until you reach this sort of critical threshold here, okay? So you have to have enough of those alleles that contribute towards a particular trait uh, in order to actually have the trait. So sometimes we talk about like a threshold number of alleles here, this threshold zone. Once you get up into that zone, you're starting to have a problem. So um, some, some 
traits, uh, it's not like height, okay? It's whether or not you have a disease, but there's a sort of uh, additive grouping of, of whether or not you have alleles that will eventually mean if, if you have enough of them, then yes, you're probably going to get that particular disease. So this is what it looks like if we go back to a old-timey Punnett square, one of the ones I told you probably shouldn't do because it's like 64 blocks, okay? Um, and so here's the heterozygote here, heterozygotes, okay? So we have um, an even number of gametes of each kind, so the, say the, um, this is for, they're doing skin color, okay? So you're taking two people with, say there are three genes for uh, skin color in, in whatever animal this is, and they're going to take two true breeding lines, right? They probably got the heterozygotes from crossing a very, very light skinned animal with a very, very dark skinned animal and getting these heterozygotes, okay? And then when you breed those heterozygotes together, you get this complete spread, right? We could do this with a forked line diagram, actually a little easier, where we'd look at um, the chance of getting A uh, dominant is three to one, the chance of getting B dominant is three to one, and so on and so forth, and um, putting that all together. But this has a nice, this is nice to be able to see as we get more um, of the dominant alleles here, we get more of the darker phenotype, okay? And so the most common one is actually gonna be the one in the middle here, this 20 out of 64, the moderate type, but we're gonna see the full range in decreasing order uh, down to just having one of the most, one chance in 64 of having the, the least extreme and this one of having the most extreme in terms of skin color, okay? So we're gonna, again, we're gonna use these numbers are gonna be helpful uh, later on. Okay. So what we start to see with complex traits is this idea of continuous variation uh, as opposed to discrete variation. Okay, which is something that Darwin talked about a little bit. Okay, if we have three genotypes and each genotype is a different phenotype, they're very distinct and discrete. This, 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 okay? We're okay, so having trouble jumping on the table. As we get to three genes, we can still kind of tell these apart, but there's generally a trend here. It's starting to look more continuous. And as we get to five different alleles all contributing, we get this very clear just spread of continuous variation. And this is what stumped a lot of early geneticists because they were looking for these discrete traits, but then seeing things like height and weight that were very clearly continuous. So how could you possibly have just one or two gene you know, choices here? It turns out, well, if you've got five, six, 10 alleles all working together, then yes, you're gonna see the effect of that. Um, all those Mendelian inherited, actually Mendelian inherited genes adding up, and now you've got what looks like continuous variation, what is continuous variation based on those alleles. Okay. So I don't know if anybody chose Herman Nissen Elm, but he basically tested this because of this early 1900s was really the time that this whole continuous versus discrete debate was getting to a head. Uh, and how could genes be particulate when we see continuous um, variation? So he's grain color in wheat to test whether or not uh, multiple genes could be affecting the same traits. So this was an actual hypothesis at one point, right? And so what he did is he took true breeding red and true breeding white and bred them together to get this intermediate color, okay, this intermediate phenotype, which everybody said, well, that's a blend, clearly. But then he self-fertilized this back on itself, okay? And that left all of my markings from previous, hold on. Wait. This probably is what happened in chapter nine without me realizing. Okay, and so then he, what he saw is that instead of just getting all pink again, which you would assume, he got this range of color, okay? And he was able to quantify and find that the appearance of the color uh, mattered in terms of statistical significance of, of stuff. So there were very, very few of the dark red came back out and very, very few of the white came back out. Um, and so what he then determined was, okay, so then it matters, there must be multiple genes because the number of alleles they are getting is contributing to the color phenotype, okay? And so that's what we call these additive alleles, um, which I will, will add to 
alleles. Okay, they're they're add, the effects of the alleles are adding together. Okay. okay. So as more quantitative loci get involved, so as more genes get involved, more classes appear in that F2 generation in more complex ratios. Okay. So if you just got one gene pair, that's great. You've got three categories here. Okay. If you've got two gene pairs, you're up to five categories. Okay. With the different as the amounts of the additive allele, how many of those you have contributing to the phenotype. Okay. Uh, let me undo my clicker clicker here. And then as we get to uh, three gene pairs, now you've got seven categories, now you've got nine, you're up to 11, and this just gets more and more looking like a um, quantitative curve there. So is it possible to figure out how many genes are actually affecting a trait? Yay, glad you asked. Yes, you can. Okay, so we can calculate the number of polygenes, okay, or genes added to alleles, genes contributing to a polygenic trait, all that goodness. So the number of polygenes contributing to a quantitative trait can be estimated based on the ratio of the F2 individuals resembling either of the two extreme phenotypes. Okay, so um, and so the, the thing here is that we what we need to solve for is 1 over 4 to the n equals the ratio of the Phenotypes. So in this case, if we um, had, let's say, we had a whole bunch of offspring and we looked at the offspring that was, um, let's say, we had that skin color one before. We're looking at the one that is the darkest, darkest black. Okay. And we find that there are, you know, rough, roughly 68 offspring and two of them are black. And we do the two out of 68. That is what we would set equal to the 1 over 4n, and then you would need to solve for n, okay? So some of these are easy. If you've got 1 out of a quarter expressing either, just pick one, an ex extreme phenotype, then you probably have three distinct phenotypic classes, and you've got um, just one gene going on there, because 1 to 4 to the n, in this case, n equals 1. Okay, if we've got two genes going on and you'll see only one out of 16 roughly on average, you're going to do like a um, pop it in your calculator and you have to then see what it is close to because you're not going to get a thing. Then you've got one to the 16th and n equals two here. So it would be this is one over four to the second power equals 116. Okay, 164th is one over four to the third power. 1 over 256 is 1 over 4 to the fourth power. Okay? And then you're solving for this over here, your n equaling the number how many genes are involved. Okay? So I think I have an example on the next slide. Okay? A cross is made between a red flowering plant and a white flowering plant. Okay, that's our true breeding cross. The F1 is a uniform pink, but in the F2, Roughly 164th of the plants have white flowers, one have 64th have red, and the rest have varying shades of pink to red. How many genes are estimated to be affecting that trait? Well, our formula is 1 over 4 to the n, okay? And our ratio of one of the extreme phenotypes, okay, we'll grab this one here, is 1 over 64, okay? So, 4 to the, 4 to the n, 4 to the what, equals 64, Okay, and this is where you pop it into your calculator. I'm not going to give you this chart. Uh, and you figure out that 4 to the third power is 64, so therefore n equals 3. There are three genes involved in this particular um, color um, phenotype. Okay. Great, so I will give you this ratio and I'll give you this thing, but hopefully you'll know how to use it. I'll give you some practice problems too. Okay, <clears throat> so next thing is we're going to talk about probability. Yay. Okay. So again, we're talking about phenotypes, right? Any characteristic that can be measured using some sort of assay, whether or not you look at it and say, oh, that's blue and that one's green, or you pet it and you say, this one is short hair and this one is long hair. Okay. Yes, Inga. 
long hair, uh, you can see different types of distributions. Okay, we've got our what we call our distinct categories here. Okay, can also be known as a binomial distribution because we just have two. And we've round or wrinkled. We have two by names, two names, binomial distribution. Or we can have either or a Gaussian distribution, or maybe this would also be called a normal distribution where you sort of have a bell curve, right? Okay, so we have our um, height here. We have a whole lot of phenotypic categories, but overall this thing looks like a big old bell curve, okay? With the most individuals having sort of the medium height in the middle. Okay. Now, there's different ways to talk about a distribution, okay? We're going to be using mostly the mean, okay? The average of the um, pool here. Usually our bells are going to be bell-shaped and not too skewed. Let's see. Okay, and then we want to know the standard deviation as our measure of variance. How, how big are the differences between the mean and the other numbers, okay? So this is one with a very with a sh smaller standard deviation here. It's a little tighter. It's a little taller. Okay, and then here with our big wide curve, our standard deviation is larger because more of our values are falling further away from the mean. Okay, so that's sort of how we're going to talk. We're going to use those to talk about the shape. We want our mean, our standard deviation, and then um, standard deviation is a measure of variance, which we'll get into, which is slightly different. Okay. So here's our mean, the average, and so let me uh, explain. Okay, so here's our x with a bar over it is our average, okay? And this thing means sum, okay? Hopefully some of your calculus is coming back to you. And we take the sum of all of our numbers, all of our x's, and then we divide by the number of values here, okay? So sum all your values, divide by how many values there were, and that will give you your average. Next, we have variance, okay? Variance, S squared, the average squared distance of all measurements from the mean for a sample of a population. So what this means, this is our sum notation again. You take whatever your x is, subtract the mean, okay? Square that, sum them all up, okay? And then divide by n, the number of observations, minus 1. This is how we're talking. Remember, this looks a little similar to our chi-square test where we have the observed minus the expected squared over the expected value. Similar. We're doing a measurement of the difference, the difference between values and our mean in order to get the variance. And this is going to tell us whether or not the population is very tight with a very small variance or very wide with very big variance and things are very different from the mean. Okay. So that gets us variance, which is listed as S school. Screw your mouse. S squared. Okay. Because the next thing we want to find is, whoops, this should be the standard deviation. So standard deviation is S. Okay. And so if we have S squared, we just need to take the square root of our variance in order to get the standard deviation. Woo. Okay. But in terms of genetics, we're going to be using variance more than we're going to be using the standard deviation. Okay, so here's a here's a, another model like I was drawing on the last one where we have the all the, all these populations have the same mean the mean equals ten, but for the red one our variance is very small so it's a very sharp tight point. For we double the variance and we see our our hill getting a lot smoother. Okay, and then with even more variance of up to five it's now a very long low hill with most of the numbers being pretty far away from the mean. Ah, there it is. There's my standard deviation. And so the standard deviation is literally the square root of the variance. Okay, so it's another, it's a unit of measurement around the mean, but in terms of, hi Biff, in terms of genetics, we're going to be using the um, uh, variance more than we're using the standard deviation. But I'd like you to be able to convert back and forth between the two. Uh, and I will give formulas, but you'll need to know what to do with the formulas. Okay. So, for example, uh, for standard deviation, that's an easy way of sort of, um, if you want to say how much of a certain population falls near the mean. Um, it's So you can say with if you're within one standard deviation of the mean, you're going to include 68.3% of your sample. And this is true for basically all of these bell curves, no matter what. If your standard deviation will be bigger or smaller, depending on how... Um, tight or wide your curve is, but it will still include this amount of your of your sample. Okay. 
So if you want to get to two standard deviations away, you're now including 95.5% of your sample. And within three standard deviations, you should have you will have 99.7% of your sample. Okay. And there's a sort of a visual representation of this that no matter what the shape of your curve, um, the standard deviation is going to include a certain amount of your um, observations. Okay. So there's one, two, and three standard deviations away.